Good afternoon, hello, and welcome to this Center for Public Integrity webinar, Strangling Accountability, the government's toothless watchdog. We don't mince words here. Uh, I'm Quentin Dempster. I'll be facilitating this uh, discussion and question time. Uh, at the outset, we acknowledge wherever we are in Australia, we meet on Aboriginal land, always was, always will be, and we pay our respects to people past, present and emerging. This uh, seminar is, uh, webinar is uh, to look at the wonderful news <laughs> that we at last have draft bills for the establishment of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Uh, announced just this, this month by the Attorney General Christian Porter. I need to uh, acknowledge that we live uh, we, where this webinar is uh, under the auspices for the Centre for Public Integrity, which is a think tank, an independent think tank dedicated to preventing corruption, protecting the integrity of our accountability institutions and eliminating undue influence in politics. The Centre for Public Integrity collaborates with academic experts, legal practitioners and retired judges on integrity reform. Joining us to uh, examine Christian Porter's, uh, the Attorney General's uh, bills establishing a Commonwealth Integrity Commission is the great advocate for public uh, integrity, Stephen Charles, AOQC. Welcome, Stephen. Stephen is a former uh, Victorian Supreme Court judge, recently gone for distinguished services to the law and to the judiciary, commercial arbitration and mediation, uh, the judicial administration and the legal profession. We'll have the uh, Stephen's wisdom and insights uh, looking at the, this bill. So let's cut to the chase first. Stephen is going to give us a summary of uh, his critique of the Christian Porter bills. And then I'm going to uh, ask him some questions arising from that summary. And then we'll have some time for your uh, submitted questions, which uh, our colleague Han Albee from the Centre for Public Integrity is uh, going to keep an eye on so we don't uh, get repetitive. Stephen, can you start? Uh, isn't this a breakthrough uh, at last? After two years or so, we've got uh, uh, some legislation before us. Well, it's um, uh, not so much a breakthrough as um, some sand seeping under the door. Um, th uh, thank you, Quentin. Um, good afternoon. Um, everyone. Um, just uh, a little more than five minutes to give you some um, comments outlining the uh, um, uh, Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Uh, the first point is it's divided into halves. The uh, first half um, deals with law enforcement bodies. There are 11 of them, but they're like the, uh, the Australian Federal Police and Home Affairs and Border Force. Now, there are 11 such bodies, and that half of the CIC is, is strong. It's got uh, um, powers to uh, um, hold public hearings, um, to uh, investigate um, complaints from whistleblowers, matters of that kind. So um, that, that half of the act is, is quite effective. Now, the second half um, deals with the remaining public sector and parliamentarians and their staff. Now, so far as the public sector half is concerned, the CIC will only investigate serious criminal conduct and can only start an investigation when there is a reasonable suspicion of it. The um, next is the, the law enforcement division, as I've said, it um, may receive um, complaints from individuals, whistleblowers. The public sector division may only receive filtered complaints. Someone who wants to complain to it has to go to one of the um, 11 law enforcement bodies, police or the ombudsman, and say, this is what I want to, to, want to complain about, and I'm asking you to pass it on. And um, the exception to that is parliamentarians may self-refer. The next point is that the public sector um, has no right to hold public hearings at all. Next, it will not make public reports 
of its investigations. It will only create briefs of evidence to go to the Commonwealth DPP for prosecution and trial if the DPP thinks there's an appropriate case to do so. Now, when you look at, at those points, the first is there's no justification for dividing this body into halves. All that it does is that it demonstrates that half of the CIC is powerful and may be effective, and that the other side that deals with public servants and parliamentarians is not. Now, next, the jurisdiction on the public sector side is hopelessly narrow. It's there to deal with a collection of criminal offences in circumstances where there's a reasonable suspicion of one. Now, an anti-corruption body is not a branch of the Australian Crime Commission. It's not seeking prosecutions for crimes and convictions. An anti-corruption body is much wider, corruption is much wider, and what it's there to do is to investigate for corruption and to expose it. Now, the next point is the question of public hearings. Nearly all um, commissioners of anti-corruption bodies will tell you that public hearings are essential for an anti-corruption body, not all the time, and only after there has been detailed private investigation so that the people who are running the public hearings know exactly what witnesses are going to say to ensure that reputations are not damaged by accident. If someone who's been guilty of what can be described as corrupt conduct is exposed, then that's not um, accidental damage. That's what these bodies are there to do, to expose corruption. Now, the next matter is um, public reports. The public sector half of this body will not have public reports. It will prepare briefs of evidence for, as I've said, the Commonwealth DPP. Now, this involves a total misconception of the purpose of anti-corruption commissions. As um, the, the first of the Australian state ones, um, ICAC was set up by Nick Greiner back in 1988. Um, part of it involved the ability of the um, ICAC to summon people to give evidence on oath. And in those circumstances, evidence given by that deponent cannot usually be used against that person in subsequent prosecutions. Of course, one consequence of that is that frequently people who've heard um, uh, witnesses in the witness box give evidence which is very damning against them and the public expects prosecutions to follow, it may very well be that that deponent can't be prosecuted because there is no evidence other than his or her own evidence which can't be used. Now, <clears throat> the next point is what is perfectly clear is that Mr. Porter's CIC is intended not to enable investigation of parliamentarians and public servants, far from it. It's there to protect them from investigation. It's there to hide their corrupt activity when it exists, rather than to expose it. Let me just give you one short example of that. Section um, 238 and following of the Act, the Draft Act, makes provision for the outcome of inquiries and preparing reports on inquiries. Subsection 7 of that Act provides, a report under this section must not include any opinion or finding that is critical either expressly or impliedly 
of or a recommendation about a a parliamentarian or b the office of a parliamentarian or c a staff member of the office of a parliamentarian you cannot even in a report of an investigation about a parliamentarian be impliedly critical about him or her now if you had for example a situation where you were looking at whether someone should have reported something and if you said that there was an obligation on the parliamentarian to um, uh, make a report about the matter you could not even say but the parliamentarian did not do so you would be being impliedly critical of him now what I say to you is that when you look at those matters that we've just been talking about, that little short description of how the, uh, um, the CIC created by Mr. Porter is to operate, it's not an, an anti-corruption bill at all. What it is, it's Mr. Porter's protection agency. Now, question, have you got, uh, um, Quentin, have you got any questions I can answer for you? <laughs> um, well, um, on the technical, on thank you for um, uh, pinpointing that uh, almost laughable provision. Um, the CIC's primary function, it said, would be the investigation of serious criminal conduct. So it's a high bar that represents corruption in the public sector. Serious criminal conduct, Mr. Porter proposes, adding new corruption offences to the Criminal Code Act 1955. They're in the schedules to the bill. Stephen, you've had a look at those criminal corruption proposed offences. Do they, in fact, broadly capture criminally corrupt conduct, public sector definitions uh, that are already on the state anti-corruption body statutes? Some of them are indeed. And some of them involve creation of new um, criminal offences. But um, corruption is not necessarily criminal at all. If you look, for example, at the sports frauds, what you had was um, the, uh, the minister being charge of a program of making various forms of sporting grants. What the Auditor General's report showed was that that was being done in such a way as to show um, an electoral bias, a political bias, that it was being given to um, um, uh, particular sporting bodies which would be um, particularly operative in um, marginal electorates designed to assist um, either the, um, uh, the, the coalition to win a marginal electorate or the opposition to lose it. Now, um, there's nothing in that which is inevitably um, criminal. If you were asked to investigate that, you would be stopped at the outset because you weren't investigating a crime. It's um, corruption involves, um, for example, um, someone who makes a large donation to a political party is usually doing what is in effect, in effect a form of bribe. I want either influence or I want a particular benefit coming which the uh, party in power um, is able to give me. Now, when um, a, a minister or a senior um, public servant responds to that, it will frequently not be criminal at all. And there's no obvious sign of crime, but it's a tilting of the um, political playing field, which is a form of corruption in the form that um, transparency has um, regularly described as a, as a misuse of taxpayers' money for a political purpose. So sports rorts would never be uh, referred or investigated by the Commonwealth Integrity Commission under the definitions of serious criminal conduct, yep. uh, serious criminal corruption uh, put out by the, the Attorney General. Yes, indeed. Just as also the Leppington pastoral um, purchase where um, some 30 odd million was um, paid for a block of land which was worth a bit less than three. Now that might involve corruption, it might simply involve gross negligence, but either way, you couldn't be starting an investigation of that under this bill either. In any event, uh, there's uh, take us to retrospectivity because uh, those of us who are concerned about uh, the 
signs or the evidentiary leads into uh, current corruption scandals, uh, there's no guarantee that they'd be looked at uh, at all on the retrospectivity angle. I've not been able to find any explicit reference to retrospectivity um, in the draft bill. Um, I think that what would be said is that um, there are a number of new offences created um, in this piece of Commonwealth legislation, which will become Commonwealth crimes. Now, it's a fairly basic um, principle of the law that um, when you bring in a new crime, it doesn't operate retrospectively. So there is um, a retrospective oh. element there that would not work. I understand what you're saying. Look, um, this is going to go to an exposure. Uh, there's a consultation process. Uh, submissions to the bill close on the 12th of February, everybody. There are to be a series of roundtable consultations with civil society and other stakeholders right through to March next year. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I note, I, I just wanted to put to you, Stephen, that Mr. Porter, uh, in defending and advocating and pitching for his bill, says the model proposed in the consultation bills learns from the significant mistakes of state integrity bodies and strikes the right balance between the need to protect the rights of the individual and the need to establish powerful investigative body that can guard against political criminal corruption at the Commonwealth level. Um, uh, what uh, he hasn't defined the significant mistakes of the state integrity bodies. Uh, are, have there been significant mistakes by state integrity bodies? Well, first, let's start with um, IBAC, the Victorian body. That's been um, in, in, in power now since uh, 2011, operating in effect since the start of 2013. It's had seven or eight um, public hearings. It's got a particularly interesting one going on at the present time um, into the Casey Council, um, in which they're investigating the attempts by a particular um, planning um, uh, person um, to um, bribe the um, Casey Council to uh, change the zoning of a large block of land from industrial to residential, which if successful, would have given a benefit of somewhere between 100 and $150 million to the owners of the land. Now, there is evidence now of very substantial amounts of money flowing on to various people, including politicians. It's um, ended in the embarrassing exposure of politicians of both parties with more to come. Now, um, I have not heard a word of complaint in Victoria in the seven years of um, IBAC's existence about these public hearings. I think everyone in the community I've spoken to thinks it is excellent work by the IBAC, highly desirable that that sort of evidence should be made public. I've not heard um, complaints um, of the Queensland Anti-Corruption Commission, which is a very effective body. So far as ICAC is concerned, there is a great deal of complaint, particularly from people in the coalition, because they've lost a number of li liberals who had too close connections with property um, de um, developers who are making large donations. Now, the, um, certainly um, the ICAC made one big mistake, and that was the attempt to investigate Margaret Kaneen, senior counsel. Now, um, it is perfectly clear from what was alleged and referred to that anything that was alleged against her certainly didn't involve uh, either um, serious um, or, uh, or systemic um, activity, and that, that was, a, was a serious mistake to make to attempt to start that investigation. Apart from that, I do not know of, of any uh, mistake that uh, ICAC has made, and I'm happy to take uh, any question which would go. There, there have been complaints about um, Mr. Greiner um, or about um, the, the present Premier. Um, there have been complaints about losing uh, Mr. O'Farrell um, as Premier. Um, I would, would uh, defend ICAC's actions in relation to any of those or other people so that uh, I accept a mistake in relation to, to Ms. Kaneen, not elsewhere. Uh, this goes to um, 
the question uh, that is, it could, I mean, there's a lot of people support uh, public um, exposure of uh, corruption for all the right reasons. And what the Victorian case you mentioned, we've been through uh, the New South Wales, a bead matter and the uh, Australian Labor Party, great public support for it, but it's a fine line. Uh, I, I'm concerned, particularly in a federal sense, uh, particularly after the AFP raids on the journalists and the what we see as overreach, that if there was uh, a use of these coercive powers uh, and they put a step wrong, public support would dissipate immediately for an anti-corruption body and it would be seen as a, a destroyer of reputation and a, a star chamber, as it were. What's the, what's the guarding against that? Because it's it is so so dangerous. It's tremendous power, but it can be dangerous as far as public support is concerned. I, I agree entirely. It is uh, most important that very great care be taken by a body of this kind if it's set up, that reputations are in the hands of that body. Now, there are various levels of protection so far as that's concerned. There is a parliamentary committee that will be keeping a very careful eye on the way in which the body operates. There will be a parliamentary inspector who will be entitled to have access to um, anything that the, the body is doing. There will be the potential for um, court supervision because it's a federal body by the Federal Court of Australia. But above all, what um, those who are conducting investigations which may become public um, must do is um, make absolutely certain that they know exactly what evidence is going to be given by witnesses who are about to be called so that persons are not drawn in by accident. Now, just to take one example, there's the, the, the examination going on with Mr. Maguire at the moment. Um, I don't think I've heard anyone say that his activities were not appropriate for public investigation by ICAC. Now, it is unfortunate that the Premier was drawn into that, but that is a consequence of her having a long history of, of communications with him at the time that he was engaging in activities that were ju justified for investigation. And uh, it, it would have been, uh, well, that, that they, uh, New South Wales ICAC has justified the calling of Premier Bjork, uh, uh, Berejiklian in that instance and said it was perfectly within the remit of uh, ICAC to do that. Yes. Um, well, on the question of uh, reputation, uh, Stephen, uh, you made the point that there will be no corrupt conduct findings. New South Wales ICAC and I think IBAC in Victoria and the Queensland Anti-Corruption Commission all make corrupt findings. So the Commissioner says, I've looked, examined all this evidence and I find that uh, your behaviour falls into the category under the Act of Corrupt Conduct. So you carry that, whether you're prosecuted or not, you carry that with the, for the rest of your life. Do you agree that, that uh, the, this Commission federally must have a capacity to, to make corrupt conduct findings or does send the evidence off to the, uh, the DPP? I do not think it simply should be sending um, evidence off to the DPP. They should certainly report to the DPP if they come across a crime, but uh, it will not go across it as a brief form. It will be a matter for the DPP to work out whether there is available and acceptable evidence to put before a court. Now, um, on the other hand, there is a difference of view among those who are pressing for an effective and strong National Integrity Commission. Some people say it should be able to make findings of corrupt conduct. Um, others are sceptical about that. I am sceptical about it. Um, I think that um, it is uh, sufficient for my purpose if it's an ability, if it has the ability to make findings of fact, and if then the um, the person who is affected by an adverse finding of fact has a right to appeal to the federal court. Now that's uh, that's uh, a bit arduous, isn't it? I mean, these investigative bodies are now executive. Uh, they're not, uh, they're not a, a sort of a judicial tribunal, administrative appeals tribunal, anything like that. An arm of uh, 
and but to ask people uh, who have uh, been adversely named to uh, correct the record, if you like, if they wanted the relief to go to the uh, to the other courts, is a is a is a very big ask, isn't it? Well, uh, I don't see it as a big ask. I see it as um, a possible um, uh, heavy burden for a court. But people who want to have something corrected um, uh, will have to take the risk of paying the costs um, if they lose. Now. Um, uh, that, that is a question of whether there should be a right of that kind. I personally would support it, um, but um, the uh, bodies uh, that, that are bodies of this kind frequently um, in describing what they have found in their investigations will say that um, such and such happened and in our view that it is correct, but it doesn't come out as a separate finding of corruption. It's an adjective used in, in the course of a report. Um, overall, and particularly as you've been quite forensic in the distinction or the discrimination to protect uh, parliamentarians that would eliminate any, uh, any investigation of slush funding, for example, on the exercise of their considerable uh, discretion on their power, uh, in some cases up to ministerial level of uh, they're the consent authorities for uh, on the stroke of the ministerial pen could uh, make people uh, uh, wealthy um, on whatever the instrument required. Uh, the question is, um, uh, is, is, this, is, is the bill therefore um, unredeemable and that we ought to, uh, ought to say, we, this is no good, please Attorney General, uh, scrap this, go back to the drawing board or can it be amended? Uh, particularly, I'm asking that because it'll go into the crossbench of the Senate where the fate of this, this, these bills will lie. The only possible redemption for this bill would be to divide it in half and take the half to de that deals with the law enforcement agencies, the tougher half, uh, and simply make that cover the whole of the federal sector. I don't think that's possible. Um, the, the intention um, that's been shown uh, by Mr. Porter in relation to the stronger half dealing with the law enforcement agencies is in effect to take ACLI, the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, and extend that and make it more effective in relation to the, um, uh, that, that half uh, of the, the federal public servants. Now, um, ACLI is a, a body which has been lamentably unsuccessful since its creation in 2006. It's um, got a very bad reputation for just simply not being able to do the work that has been um, sent across to it. Um, it's been um, stigmatized repeatedly in reports in the newspapers as a body which is unable to do the job properly. Thank you, Stephen. Um, the heads of all Commonwealth law enforcement agencies, you've listed them, would have a mandatory obligation to refer corruption issues to the CIC. The heads of public sector agencies, other than a parliamentarian's office, as you pointed out, would also have a mandatory obligation to report suspected corruption. That sounds all right. But the CIC, quote, would not receive referrals from those within the public sector integrity divisions jurisdiction from the public at, at large. You pointed it in your opening remarks. Why this pointed exclusion of public tip-offs to the CIC? I mean, David Ip in New South Wales have made it clear that they could never have got onto uh, mining uh, exploration uh, license corruption be uh, unless somebody had picked up the phone and said, hey, have a look at this. Uh, this, is, this stinks, this is questionable. That was exactly what happened in the, um, the uh investigation of the mining licenses in the Bailong Valley and involving the Obeid family, it started with a telephone tip-off. Now, that would have been nowhere near enough to um, start any sort of investigation um, of, um, uh, of what uh, was, was going on there. Um, and that is one of the problems. These um, tip-offs are very important to anti-corruption bodies. The fact that um, uh, people are not able to make complaints direct to the body in the weaker half is simply an attempt to muzzle complaints. Uh, it will um, intimidate people. Uh, people will not be enthusiastic about going to 
uh, any other agency and saying, look, I want this to be passed on. Um, it, uh, it's, as I say, I think it's an attempt to muddle. Um, there is provision for the Attorney General to prevent the Commonwealth Integrity Commission access to certain information through uh, an S270 certification process. What's that about? Uh, I can only guess at the moment, but uh, obviously a body of this kind which has total coverage of um, uh, public servants would be in a position to um, deal uh, with people in the Defence Department, um, in our intelligence agencies, um, ASIS, ADASIO and the others, and there may very well be um, uh, information which it's uh, impossible um, to uh, allow to be made public. And it, I, I assume that it's matters of that kind. Um, I can't say that I'm, I'm happy about it being there, having regard to the prosecution of Witness K and Bernard Collieri and um, this particular Attorney General's um, attitude to, to those prosecutions. ASIO and the security agencies are covered by the CIC? It, it's the intention, is it, that it should be uh, there um, to deal with um, all of these bodies. That's uh, as I understand it. What about the, the judiciary, the federal courts? Uh, that at the moment is not covered. Now, um, I can understand um, a hesitation about trying to cover federal judges. There, uh, there is the, the problem of the separation of powers in Chapter 3 of the Constitution. Um, I have always thought myself that it was possible for a body of this kind to uh, um, investigate um, judges at the early stages of an investigation, but so long as there is someone there who is looking at the way judges operate, it's um, entirely proper that judges should be open to investigation if done properly. If they intend to set up a judicial commission to ensure this happens, then uh, that the problem is taken away. And I would accept that. I, I might point out um, in relation to the, um, the, this question of public hearings that um, part of the um, objection that this is totally hypocritical to have no public hearings uh, in relation to the, the public sector and parliamentarians is the um, Attorney General and those who helped him create this bill are obviously perfectly happy for the um, people in these 11 law enforcement agencies and those who deal with them to be subjected to public hearings. So um, uh, all, all the complaint about the destroying of people's reputations, they're obviously perfectly happy for that to happen in relation to these law enforcement bodies. And I might add that there is in fact um, a piece of Commonwealth legislation from 2012, the Judicial Misbehaviour and Incapacity Parliamentary Commissions Act of that year, which provides for parliamentary commissions to investigate judicial misbehaviour, and that is judges in the federal sphere up to the High Court. And by section 23 of that Act, those hearings are to be in public. <laughs> so Mr. Porter and those surrounding him are perfectly happy for federal judges up to the High Court to be dealt with um, in public for those in these various um, law enforcement agencies and those who deal with them to be dealt with in public. And yet we have these complaints, these blatherings about uh, the, the damage to reputations of parliamentarians who shouldn't be dealt with in public. Now, Fitzgerald long ago um, in the 1980s dealing with the Bielke Peterson government and the dreadful corruption in Queensland said it's a complete misconception to think that you should protect um, parliament, parliamentarians and public servants from embarrassment in these sort of things. Proper democracy depends upon informed voters. Um, and we should make the general point that uh, when uh, governments are moved, state and federal and territory governments are moved to set up royal commissions, they are expected uh, and uh, would be laughed out if they weren't in 
public get the benefit, the public gets the benefit of, we're, we're saying this uh, Commonwealth Integrity Commission is a standing Royal Commission with the powers, even greater powers than the Royal Commission, and then not to have public hearings uh, makes a, a joke of it. If the Hain Commission had, be, um, had been conducted um, under Mr Porter's rules for the public service and parliamentarians, it would have had no public hearings from start to finish, and all of them were in public. It would have made no public report, uh, and the first that anyone in the public would have become aware of its activities was if the Commonwealth DPP had launched a prosecution and the matter actually ended in court. All right, now you've got a list of, of um, questionable behaviour or practices, but I, I want to ask you because it's still uh, in the news, we're in a 24 hour news cycle, Stephen, as you know, but uh, and, and there's uh, the announcement today about the war crimes atrocities and uh, investigations of uh, into some 39 killings that will uh, uh, dominate. But I want to go back to things that uh, 24 hours ago, and that was robo debt. Uh, yes. There's a settlement out of court, uh, no liability of the, it's it, it, to be signed off by the courts at the moment, but there's a settlement out of court. Uh, there'd be no liability uh, by the Commonwealth. Uh, and its ministers um, is, uh, is there's is a question of illegality in robo debt that the data matching was uh, was demonstrably illegal. Uh, would uh, would robo debt uh, head the list of your uh, questionable behaviour or corrupt practices? I mean, on the, on the, even on Christian Porter's uh, serious criminal corruption uh, uh, criteria. Uh, I'm not sure about the answer to that. It may be that the whole robo debt business is an example of monumental incompetence and um, gross negligence, I think, is, is a different question. The public needs to be informed about it and make its own um, view about whether a, a government okay. um, operates under that system. Um, sports rorts seems to me to be a, a better example because uh, that, as the Auditor General showed, to his cost, because having done so, the consequence is he's, he's had his funding cut. <laughs> um, uh, after all, he's caught the uh, coalition out both on sports shorts uh, and on the Leppington pastoral purchase in recent times. Now, everyone else is getting money, but not the Auditor General. Now, um, the, the list of things that uh, you could have had being investigated by a body of this kind is a long one. Um, too too long to cover the lot, and the, nowadays they are getting into the papers just about every day. But um, if you could go back to things like Securency um, and Note Printing Australia, these these bodies that uh, were paying huge bribes to um, win contracts to um, make um, um, notes um, for foreign countries, and paying huge bribes being paid to uh, um, tax haven accounts in the Channel Islands and elsewhere. Now that was going on with the knowledge right up to the board of the Reserve Bank, which was the controller of those companies. You had um, plenty of evidence of rank corruption in the Defence Department, which um, was um, reported um, in uh, evidence um, reported in, in the age by various insight teams that um, they uh, the, the people in the Defence Department were well aware of corruption there, of um, contracts being given to particular people in circumstances where there was uh, inadequate examination uh, of um, the, 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 the tenderers, uh, in circumstances where um, uh, uh, people um, outside were offering um, good um, either money or satisfactory contracts um, to uh, people inside the Defence Department as a way of getting contracts from the department. There, there was detailed evidence in a report in December 2017. That was followed by an, an audit, an internal audit of the Defence Department, which was uh, largely defective because most of the individual uh, matters that they tried to audit had defective documents either no documents or a lot of documents missing. Now, um, if you look at the purchase of the submarines in 2015, there are very strange things 
about that matter. Um, the French naval group is a body which is mired in corruption. In about five different cases, they have paid enormous bribes to gain contracts um, in Southeast Asia that they've got in terms of hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, um, one wonders um, why it was that an uncapped bid um, by the French Naval Group uh, was accepted in circumstances where there were other bids available from Krupp in Germany and Mitsubishi in Japan. Are we um, being left uh, with um, a contract which is going to provide us with submarines at some stage, goodness knows when, and for goodness knows how much. Now, I can give you plenty of others. Um, the contract um, with the Paladin Group um, in relation to uh, the Manus Island security. Um, there are matters that require investigation about that. The Hello World travel contract, which it's alleged a number of parliamentarians had um, um, uh, parcels of shares in. There are a whole series of matters that um, make up a long list that uh, would be uh, most interesting to investigate, quite apart from the, the most up-to-date and recent, such as the, the sports rorts um, and the Leppington pastoral. In uh, defence materiel that you've, ref you've referenced, um, uh, under Christian Porter's uh, Commonwealth Integrity Commission, defence material procurement, uh, that, is, that would be covered, wouldn't, would it not? So if there was any concern by uh, the Director General of the Defence Department or the Head of the Defence Department say, um, uh, this looks a bit uh, dodgy, I have to mandat mandatorily refer it to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. That would be covered, wouldn't it? Uh, that that um, would be... It's the, the Defence Department is not one of the law enforcement agencies. Now, the, de the principal defect with Ackley um, before these arrangements was that Ackley only required the heads of various law enforcement agencies to make reports about corruption within their bodies. And procurement in either the defense or health departments, both of which spend billions of dollars each year on procurement, they weren't covered at all. But aren't they covered in the, um, in the public sector division of the CIC and the, the Defence Department would, would have a duty under that act to refer? It, uh, that is possible, although I'm not clear about that. A procurement previously was not covered at all and would only have been covered uh, if, if it remains that situation, uh, would only be covered under the, um, the public sector agency and parliamentarians. Right, okay, uh, that's <laughs> disturbing and revealing all at the one time. How does, this is a question from uh, one of our participants, how does the Commonwealth Integrity Commission fit with existing accountability institutions, uh, i.e. the Australian Electoral Commission, uh, a codes of conduct, etc.? Well, again, um, the, the, they, they do provide certain standards for operation, and it may be that a breach of those standards would certainly amount to a, the, the form of political corruption, which if the body were able to accept uh, a complaint from an individual whistleblower would be available for investigation. Okay, are there any sections that deal with private to private corruption, i.e. corporate corruption? No, I, 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 unless um, uh, even if a corporate body deals with a, a federal agency, I don't think at the moment that that is covered. But um, the uh, ACCC, um, APRA, the regulators are covered if somebody's, so there's uh, the, the, what we know in corruption or uh, corruption prevention, a thing called regulatory capture where the vested interest captures the regulator. Yes, uh, yes, they, they, they um, indeed, could cover these things, but may not. Um, so that's a big, uh, uh, we have to put a big asterisk beside uh, that. Yes. Um, uh, as you've said, uh, we, we really ought to go back to the, uh, to the uh, drawing board on this. Um, but the 
the public hearing seems to me to be the uh, the key factor. If Christian Porter was moved to say, yeah, let the sector division have uh, 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 public hearings, would that be uh, satisfactory to you? Uh, it would make a very dramatic change. But when uh, Mr. Porter made the announcement um, about a fortnight ago that he was bringing in this legislation, he was asked by journalists present, would he contemplate um, changing um, his draft to include public hearings uh, for that week and a half? And he said, no, the government was absolutely firm on that. So he's a hard, he's a hardliner against public hearings uh, yes. uh, for the for the anything other than the law enforcement uh, yes. uh, agency. He said he wasn't going to stand for the mistakes that um, state bodies had made um, and which had wrecked people's reputations. Well, I would ask him to indicate which of the three main bodies uh, South Australia doesn't have one. Uh, which of the three main bodies, um, New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland? Just let us know uh, which cases have involved uh, unfair trashing of reputations. As we get into this debate, the onus will be on the Attorney General uh, and uh, his um, uh, allies within the government to clearly indicate where uh, reputations have been unfairly uh, impacted by the state anti-corruption bodies. Yes, because, uh, because I say that all of this is, is an attempt to protect parliamentarians from investigation and exposure. Nothing more nor less. Here's another question, Stephen. Has this bill been designed on purpose? Uh, a, cynical, <laughs> uh, a cynical observer, uh, hiding MPs, distracting and kicking the can down the road. So that's a, a, a cynical political motivation behind it. That's a, that's a big charge of the Attorney General. Uh, I am right with your cynic. Um, I think it's, it's exactly that. He's been forced into this because the public now are to a substantial extent supporting. Um, the polls are suggesting that more than 80% in the community want um, a, uh, um, uh, an uh, anti-corruption body with teeth. Now, th this has been um, this has been, has been argued by the Australian Institute Judges Group, of which I'm one. We're all um, retired judges, non-partisan. And two years ago, um, Chris Merritt in The Australian described us as a gaggle of disgraceful extremists. <laughs> now, um, that, that demonstrates his objectivity. Um, but the point that I'm seeking to make is that um, on Mr. Merritt's view, uh, then most of the rest of the community uh, are outrageous extremists. And he seems to me himself to be one and a hypocritical one because he's perfectly happy for public hearings to take place for the law enforcement bodies. Uh, but he, uh, he's from the rural, what's an outfit called the Rural Rule of Law Institute, uh, I think. Uh, uh, and this is, he would argue that uh, these standalone anti-corruption bodies are anathema to the rule of law. Uh, what do you say about that? That means that the, the so-called real courts are the place to administer the rule of law. Well, I say coming from Mr. Merritt's mouth, it's a fatuous statement, um, but uh, I'm a great supporter of the rule of law. It's been part of my life up to now, but it's a regrettable fact that when you have people in parliaments and elsewhere who have great power and great money at their disposal, as Andrew Wilkie said when the casino affair broke, that um, it, this business of giving favours for favours is something which goes on in parliament all the time, and it shouldn't. And it's that sort of matter that those who want an effective anti-corruption commission want to stop. If uh, on the question of resources, I mean, Christian Porter and the Expenditure Review Committee of the Cabinet, I think, have earmarked 147 million, a staff of uh, 172 um, uh, to get it uh, get it going. If his model uh, gets up, is that um, is that? Uh, I know you argued about the ineffectiveness of the of the model on current display, uh, but uh, is that sufficient given the totality of a of a uh, uh, $600 billion uh, 
uh, annual budget of the Commonwealth now uh, with our, uh, our debts uh, out as far as the eye can see. When you take the, the amount that a body like um, IBAC in Victoria is given annually, it's about 40 million. Now, um, having looked at the amounts that go to the anti-corruption commissions around Australia, and given the much greater load that would come on to a National Integrity Commission, the view I had was that it would probably take something in excess of 100 million annually um, to run the National Integrity Commission properly. The, the amount that Mr. Porter is talking of, I'm not sure first if uh, the 140 odd million is um, for a single year or for a four year say period, um, in which case it's you know, something like 35 million a year. Now that would be far too little. Um, and um, uh, at the moment, I think um, um, uh, Ackley, which uh, would be part of this body, gets something, um, I, think, I think around 15 uh, million a year. So I, I assume that they're, they're thinking of spending maybe 40 to 50 million a year. That would not be enough. And the best way to stop a body of this kind being effective is to underfund it. Um, yes, um, uh, expediency uh, again. The um, it, it goes. We'll see what happens with the consultations and uh, whether Mr. Porter is movable. He's obviously not movable on the what the fundamental issue of public hearings. Um, uh, and we'll see where this goes. To what is your um, advocacy? What's your best argument to the crossbench senators? I mean. It's quite astounding that they, the, to me, coming from New South Wales, uh, Stephen, where <laughs> the Labor Party hated the ICAC, uh, except when it was getting stuck into the libs here. They hated it. It, it destroyed the like, New South Wales Labor Party's voter base here from 2011. Uh, they've only been slowly clawing back any sort of uh, credibility. Now that uh, uh, Gladys Berejiklian's in a bit of trouble, it's, uh, it's e evening the... Uh, the negative perceptions about the Labor Party in, in this state. Uh, and it's it's significant that the, the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party caucus, including New South Wales members, uh, support a, a, a Dreyfus's model, um, Mark Dreyfus's model of, a, of an ICAC. What is your best pitch to the crossbench senators to, uh, to make amendments or to ask for the bill's withdrawal and uh, resubmission? What's the best pitch to them? Because the fate of this wonderful integrity instrument rests with them. Uh, well, I think the first thing to remember is that both the Victorian IBAC and the New South Wales ICAC were set up by conservative premiers and that the ICAC has been repeatedly praised by one premier after another in New South Wales for the terrific work it was doing. The um, next thing, I think, is that Mr. Porter's activity in relation to this body for the last two years, it was December 2018 that he first put forward his proposal substantially in the form that we've got now in this draft bill. I think he's been deliberately delaying it over that time because he knew that when it came out, when it, came out it was going to attract a very great deal of hostile criticism from people such as myself from Transparency and from AJ Brown's um, body and in, in Queensland, uh, from all of those who've been pressing for a proper anti-corruption commission, I would say to the crossbenchers, don't pass this bill, it's hopeless. Just um, quick, just quick final question. Are there any proposals for real-time disclosure of donations included in this bill, um, which goes to the the core of slush funding and the delay in, in transparency. Of course, it, I, I do not know of any such proposals. Right. The Commonwealth should look at the Queensland proposals for um, re requiring um, donations to be made public and indeed capped. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, we're very grateful, Stephen, for your insights uh, into the deficiencies of the bill. And if uh, Attorney General Porter or his, uh, his uh, staff are watching, uh, please take this as part of the consultation process 
uh, and uh, we're grateful to the Centre for Public Integrity uh, for uh, conducting this uh, webinar. If you want to support the work of the Centre for Public Integrity, please go to their website. In the meantime, uh, thanks it's again. It's 13 hours. Thanks again, Stephen, and uh, we'll see you all down the road as we fight for public integrity in our democracy. All the best. We're always happy to help the Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you.